Professor Wale Shoyinka, one of the most iconic writers in Nigeria's history, is about to release another novel. Now, in case you did not know, he had two novels he wrote in the past. Now, this is his third novel, and he's doing this after about 40, over 40 years or so. Now, this new novel is titled Chronicles of the Happiest People on Earth. A lot of us have been looking forward to it. Everybody has been looking forward to this new novel by Professor Wale Shoyinka. Our own Kayo the Alliance, they sat down with the professor to discuss this new novel. Enjoy this. Reading through the book, I see social commentary. I see a lot of drama. Um, I see satire. Um, I see nuggets of wisdom. What's essentially your goal in writing this book? Is it for entertainment? Are you trying to tell us something? I hope I am trying to tell you something. <laughs> it's, been, uh, it's been material under pressure. I think I actually began seriously to think that I should bring this out in the form of a novel about two years ago. And maybe I even wrote a few paragraphs here and there. And, and then finally, it got to a point where I had to put it all together in, in a kind of, a, in a structured form, sort of. And uh, for this, in fact, I needed to get away from Nigeria. This might interest you. My first break was about a year and a half ago. Somebody lent me a village, uh, his cottage in his village in Yene in Dakar, I acknowledge him there. And then a few months later, I was lucky to find another escape. It's amazing. You would think that this is a place from which one doesn't need to escape. Mm. But this place is situated in another space called Nigeria. And there's no way one can bottle oneself away completely from Nigeria. And then I needed to get away at least to break the back of the novel that was building up in my head. So I had a second break when, um, in fact, ex, uh, former president Kufu lent me his house in uh, Ebridi, they call it, or Aburi, we call it here. And so I was able to have another concentrated period of about eight to, between eight and 10 days. And then finally came the unexpected COVID lockdown. And I found myself here, bed, desk, eat, bed, desk, eat, and so I was finally able to, to finish it. And what is there is, in fact, I hope what everybody recognizes is Nigeria. And that's a sad space. That's a real sad piece of real estate uh, that whoever is supposed to have created this world inflicted on us Nigerians. Mm. Now, you mentioned in your earlier response that um, it's, it's been long in coming, that's the book. Um, what did it take to eventually create the masterpiece that we have today? And that's coming from the background of your publisher saying that this work is, it, they described it as narrative uh, uh, toward the force. Uh, I mean, it took some metal, some energy to put this together. Can you share the journey with us? Was it moving? Was it interesting? Was it, did it excite you going back to prose and being able to express yourself in prose form, as you, as you have said? What was the journey like writing this? Oh, I have no problem with prose, you know, uh, but prose is different from fiction and either is different from prose fiction. So it's the, the problem was not prose, but to use the word energy. Now that took energy, that really sapped me. Uh, both the two short sessions I had, highly concentrated in which I didn't see anybody, I didn't talk to anybody, it was very draining. I say this for writers, those who think they can just sit down and churn out some, mm. It requires also energy. It takes stamina, which I didn't think I, still had, I was capable of. But somehow I managed to, you know, put this together. And I had no choice. 
because, uh, and I had no choice about bringing it up to a boil because consider this, I'm locked down here, I'm quarantined myself here and uh, I can, of course, have books, masses of books to read, I have lots and lots of works I want to do. There's masses of work to do in this environment. It never stops mm. trying to salvage this, the degradation of this place from the encroaching neighborhood, even though it's protected. So there's so many things I could find to do here. But this has been an internal demand for a number of years. And the more this society decays, the greater betrayals we encounter. Uh, look at what happened. Ensars is just another manifestation of this novel. You know, it's something coming to the boil collectively and which has to be expunged if people are not to sort of implode among themselves. So take the novel as, yes, just another feature of, uh, of uh, SARS and, and uh, SARS. This society needs to be told some truths in, and told in some very harsh, rigorous way. And when I say society, I'm not talking about just government. I'm talking about a society which accepts, which has been programmed or which has programmed itself to accept the rape of children, the butchery of humanity for, for rituals, money rituals, lynch, the lynch mentality has become common, a society which actually permits a program of humanity, no other word for it. Uh, Northeast one day, 100 dead. Another just come further south, 50. Schools, students, people who are being butchered. In the meantime, within that society, there are those doing very, very well for themselves, myriad ways. So the enormous contradiction, the pressure of contradictions within society has to find expression in one way or the other. It finds all the time, you know, a lot of the theater which goes on right now is, an, is a reflection and an expression of things coming to the boil within creative minds. You see, it's, it's interesting that you mention um, the possibility of undercurrents of negative energy. And that brings me to the topic, uh, the title of the book, The Happiest People on Earth. Two things, are we really happy? And the second thing, is there no possibility that some time later we might reach the tipping point and then lose that happiness altogether? And it's a very fresh layer of chaos. Well, the title, you know, is meant to be, uh, is deliberate. <laughs> it's a negative title. <laughs> it doesn't really talk about the happiest people. It has no intention of its being the happiest people. But now, it's in, I'm glad you mentioned the title because how do ideas for a creative work come into, into being? Sometimes it's just something somebody said. But somebody says that thing in a particular context, and so it strikes you very forcibly. It is a fact that uh, on an index, you know, all these people, they have this poll, they take polls, the most miserable people in the world, the most corrupt people in the world, the most this and that. And I came across about, this is at least some, close to 10 years ago, a piece of news where Nigeria was rated as the second happiest people in the world. I was aghast. I said, who are these people? Where do they live? I mean, which, which Nigeria are they talking about? So there's a, a deliberate irony about, oh, well, look at the happiest people. Let's just see what constitutes their happiness. But also, we have a habit of swallowing bile in this nation, mm. which, which is a great pity of putting a brave face on things. The danger of that is that there comes a point where this veneer shatters completely and it, it manifests itself, as I said, in like an NSARS uh, movement. Uh, it manifests itself maybe at election time. It manifests itself in sporadic zones of violence which strike people as being meaningless. But actually, there's a reason behind it. There's a build-up of causative numerous 
causative for, uh, uh, forces behind such a moment. So the title is not supposed to be taken at face value. Okay, so I'm in another hall of the exhibition being hosted by the African Artist Foundation. It's been fun looking at all the various artworks. I mean, they are just incredible, incredible artworks. Um, but this is where we have to round up the program. As always, we'll be delighted to get your feedback through any of our social media platforms displayed on your screen. My name is Ola Kunle Kasumo. Remember, one great book can change your life. Bye-bye.